do I have my act together? Maybe, maybe not. And I'm not, I, uh, I put it There's out Larry there. White. I've seen Larry White all over the place. He's winning all sorts of awards lately, I understand. Yes, I he do. is. So how do you do, where do you live, Larry? Westlake Village. And so you're part of this group, why? Because um, I like the group. And it, he I likes it. There you go. I, I initially joined because I had a, it's too far for me to go for meetings, but yeah. um, um, I joined because I wanted to go on the field trips and things like that. And then, of course, COVID broke out, so yeah, I haven't done any field trips with them. But I like the group, I like the people, and so yeah, I he's in the Thousand Oaks Club also, so he's in two clubs. He's also in the uh, SIPA group, Chad PPA group, right? Yeah, yeah, and um. Yeah, that's where I know him from because I'm part of that group down there too. Very good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to your presentation tonight. Have you ever seen me speak? Uh, I've seen you judge a few times. I don't think I've ever seen you speak. Uh, it's about the same thing. I kind of grown on the. Um, yeah, the. Uh, well, hopefully, enjoy it. We'll see what happens. Six people is a pretty good turnout, so we'll go with it. <laughs> there should be more than that. I know that there's a few other people who were planning on being here, so we'll give them a few more seconds here to like five minutes or so to no worries. Get their, get their coffee, finish so dinner. What's the makeup of your group, mostly retire mostly retirees. Uh, I'm gonna say yeah. Um there's a, a good number that are working. Yeah. Uh, a few young people in the professional people. photography, or in, the, in other words, Most, they have another... no other in other careers. Most of yeah. the people I don't know. We have very few professional photographers in our group. Um, just avid amateurs. Mm -hmm. We'll put it that way. Um, and uh, some people are selling some of their work, you know, as art pieces or whatever. And there's a few. Uh, portrait photographers, but not a great many. Um, Most of landscape? But, uh, I think everybody likes doing everything. Yeah. <laughs> most, for the most part, there's a lot of landscape, wildlife, people like uh, doing wildlife. Yeah. Uh, they go on a lot of the- You guys also have like, such great access to the uh, jets up there and et cetera going off up there. So it's- uh, that's Yes. Pretty, most people don't have air, Aircraft photography is quite popular. Do weirdly, I have not done any of it, <laughs> even though it's right here. I just well, haven't had to, haven't, haven't gotten to that? do it. I don't have the lens. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, whose fault is that? You can go right over to BJ's corner and jump in every day <laughs> and do it. <laughs> um, mostly digital as opposed to film. Uh, yes. Oh, all digital. digital. I don't, does anybody do film anymore? There I are do. a couple of people. Um, there are a couple of people who do film. Oh, uh, are there? Okay. But for the most part, it's, uh, I would say it's digital. And there's a lot of people who used to do film who have transitioned to doing digital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I do a there, fair amount. A lot of my fine art works in uh, film. I shoot eight by 10 medium format, 35. And then I do, I don't have a dark room now, so I do mostly alternative processes, mm -hmm. like oh, cool. uh, Van Dykes, et cetera, so. I ha have very little background in that. That would be something I would enjoy learning because mm -hmm. uh, I loved uh, chemistry in college. When I got out of college, I worked as a chemist for a few years and until I had kids. <coughs> and I feel like that stuff would, enjoy I would enjoy that a lot <laughs> but I have never done it um so didn't you guys just have a trip up 395 you're up at uh Levitt Meadows is that what it's called or um uh, you know we went over up to, by Bodie we and Mono Lake yes we did Bishop Mono Lake Bodie uh up in the canyons for some fall color yeah um, that was in mid-October yeah I think uh Andrew's part of your group sometimes yes yeah he was up there He's, with you guys yeah, he should be here tonight. Uh, I don't know who Steve Lewis is, but maybe that's him. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm the brother. Oh, you're, you're the brother. Oh, you're Andrew's brother. 
Well, welcome, Steve. Thank you. Good to meet you. Nice to oh, meet here you. comes Andrew. Yeah, he's the bane of my existence. I'm sorry, he's not the bane of my existence. No, he's a good guy. He's a very good guy. Oh, as long as we keep this cat under control. Oh, look, see, he even has a picture from there. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> you were there when you took that, Kathy. I was. Yep. Um, Bristlecone Pines is one of my favorite places in the world. In I the, still uh, have not gotten there. You I haven't been to Bristlecone Pines? <sighs> no, I'm a new, I'm a fairly new photographer. Uh, I've only been doing it seriously for maybe six years mm -hmm. or so. So I still ha um, am learning and I haven't had all the exciting places to go yet, so. I have a cat coming into the screen, some areas. <laughs> no. Stop, stay away, go. <clears throat> Hi, Nan, how are you? I'm fine, how about you? Good. Good. Hi, Nan. Good. Hi. Now we're getting quite a, a turnout, actually. Yeah, I told you, you just have to wait for people to, you know. Dribble in, in, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just six o'clock now, so. It is. It is. We'll Thanks give people for, another uh, minute or two. Facebook, um, Kathy. You are welcome. That worked well last week, so I thought I would do that again. You uh, posted it on Facebook? Yes. Uh, I posted it in our group on Facebook and uh, in a couple of our other photography groups that are up here, local, uh, that are more portrait-based and things like that. So hopefully some of them might be joining us. Although I don't know if any of these people are, so. <sighs> um, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys some announcements. Welcome to our club meeting tonight. This is a LPA workshop and uh, it's our second meeting of the month. Last week was our competition, creative competition. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined that and participated. Um, it was good. We had a good time and learned some stuff. Um, so tonight we have Tim Meyer, but next, uh, next month in February, on February 16th at six o'clock, we have Joe Edelman, Edelman, I'm not sure how we say his name, The Art of Seeing. And he's gonna speak about success in photography is in the details. So, um, he does a lot of teaching and uh, great, has a great YouTube channel. So this should be, he should do, be a really good speaker. And then on February 23rd, our workshop is gonna be on backing up our file management skills because we usually need some help with that. And uh, Dave Wilkins is gonna be teaching that. In March, uh, we have a competition, human interest competition, and Kevin Carson is going to be judging that one. So think about that when you're out and about. I know lately we haven't been out and about a lot, but human interest uh, is a great subject, Matt, subject you can go anywhere and take pictures of people. Um, and so let's get those pictures ready to enter for that competition. On March 23rd, we have Hazel Meredith speaking. She's going to speak about working with textures and overlays, turning ho-hum into a work of art. So um, we have some great speakers coming up in the next couple months. And uh, we're just trying to keep things going during this interesting time till we all get vaccinated and can back, get back together and uh, enjoy each other's company in person. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Tim Meyer. He is a, um, he's one of the professors at Antelope Valley College for, uh, I can hear someone. Who can I hear? <laughs> All right, people. <laughs> Turn off those microphones if you don't need to speak. Um, I wanted to introduce Tim a little more, a little better than I was. So hang on a second. 
I've also, he's an author of two books that are very yes. good. Yes. I'll get, uh, hang on a second. Um, so, uh, Tim has 37 years of experience teaching uh, in, in photography. He's been internationally recognized and is well respected for his craftsman level technique and is always evolving innovative style. In addition to having taught full time at Brooks Institute, Tim is honored to be sought after as a mentor, speaker, and workshop leader worldwide. Tim's book, The Portrait, Understanding Portrait Photography, a comprehensive study of portraiture co-written with Glenn Rand and published by Rocky Nook, is available in English, German, Italian, and Chinese, and then this is in its second edition. So what's the other book that you've written, Tim? Um, light Styling. It's on studio light lighting. Styling. Great. And is that with Rocky Nook as well? No, that's actually with Amherst. And then I've got uh, three other, I think, self-published books. Great. Well, uh, so we are going to turn things over to him. He is speaking on the real Rembrandt. Um, and we'll be discussing various things relating to that, the history of lighting and how to incorporate that into our current photography. So, uh, Tim, you can go ahead and screen and take it from here. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Um, sure beats the drive. I mean, it would be an hour and a half, two hours for me to get up there, but I, I'm glad to be able to do it this way from the comfort of my home in Cozy Chair. Um, I have a couple of you that I actually know, and some of you know me. Uh, if you don't get the jokes, don't worry about it. Uh, I have a very dry sense of humor. Ask Andrew about that, or um, any of any Larry would probably be able to help help you understand that also. I've uh, been around a long time and I do a lot of different things. The program tonight's really on kind of a rabbit hole that I've gone down, but let me share my screen and I'll show you kind of some of my other work. And by the way, the size of the group is, enough, is small enough so that if um, there are any questions as you go along, I don't know, Kathy, if you wanna uh, monitor the chat or if they wanna speak up, they can. But I'll go through the program, and if you have questions along the way, or um, put them in the chat, and have, uh, either put them in the chat or kind of try to get my attention. Um, this is my Instagram page. It is uh, Tim underscore I underscore Meyer, and that's me. But you can see some of the diversity of the stuff that I do. I do landscapes. Actually, I think when you guys were up in October, up along uh, by Mona Lake, etc. I went over to the Pinnacles and shot this. I think that was the last good night of a clear um, Milky Way. So I did that. I, I picked up a new camera and I wanted to experiment with it. But I do a fair amount of landscape work. Uh, I do film-based work, uh, anything from 35 millimeter medium format and or uh, eight by 10 inch format for some of my fine art work. Do a lot of Native American work. Uh, and I also do, I don't know, Lots of seminars in lots of different places. So if you want to follow me and see some of the other places I'm going to be, um, you can also go to Tim Meyer Photography on Facebook and you'll see me there. But I'm um, sure most of you recognize where that is. And that was actually for a project that I'm working on that is right here. There's another website up here. I do have a professional website, but it's just for mostly people and uh, mostly older work. A lot of the different things that interest me now are uh, landscape work, and I have a project I'm working on now. If you go to timmeyer.myportfolio.com, you can see um, a whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, this is a project I'm working on currently. This is done Native American uh, doorways, actually, and mostly in the Four Corners area. These were shot on film, mostly medium format, and then they're processed with uh, handmade Van Dyke prints. So I work with a lot of different things. This is some of my fine art work that nobody understands. And then this is other fine art work that's probably a little more understandable. This was done years ago um, for my master's program. Uh, this is some of the more of the commercial work. So you can see I do an awful lot of people, uh, whether it's on location. Again, I, I work, I've worked a fair amount with natives. And then uh, I do a certain amount of fashion work. Here's some of my uh, outdoor work. 
and you guys know where that is in Death Valley. Um, and then wedding work I've done and then just seminars, et cetera, and kids. So um, that'll give you a pretty good idea of where I am and what I'm doing, if you're interested in any of that. And if you, we talked about the books, here's the publications. Uh, you can get that on Amazon if you're interested. So, uh, and that's the second book I was talking about, Shaping Life. So otherwise, uh, I don't want to bore you any more with myself. And so let me actually get started with the program. You guys can see and hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start out here. Uh, I know this isn't necessarily a major area of interest for everyone, but it, I'm going to try to make it practical for you guys in some ways, because there's a lot of techniques that I've learned along the way, just in my study of Rembrandt, that uh, has really impacted the work uh, across all the different spectrums that I use it. Uh, when I originally put this together, uh, almost not quite a year ago, um, I've been studying Rembrandt for a long, long time, but I decided to put a cover page together. And so Rembrandt has taken more portraits of himself, uh, painted more portraits of himself than perhaps most other artists. And so I put together a chronological progression of his uh, images. And he lived a very interesting life, uh, some of it very, very successful. And in the end, uh, his wife died, his son died. Uh, some people think of him a very traumatic or tragic individual. I don't necessarily. He certainly had things that uh, were complicated in his life, but um, an incredible artist. But what, if you study him a lot, what you start to understand that this is his early, he's like 22, 23 here, and you can see his progression through here. And this is where he's trying to produce work where he's gonna uh, promote himself. And then this is where he starts hitting it big and becomes incredibly successful. And this is where things start to go. Uh, his wife dies, etc. But you see the progression, you can see the expressions. It's really very interesting uh, how it became such an interesting study of his life. So uh, let's see here, back here. Works better when it goes forward. Okay, probably it's a, it's important for you to understand that as a I spent the first major part of my career as a commercial photographer photographing people, uh, mostly portraits for children, family, uh, headshots, executives, celebrities, etc. And so I was all about portraiture. And uh, after that, I got into teaching and have been teaching for probably 15 years full time. But um, I came from what my daughter described as a cultural wasteland, meaning that I had no art history, no understanding. I was kind of like a blue collar worker type uh, <clears throat> background. And so we didn't understand art or anything. And so when I was going through school and when I was working for the studios I worked with, they talked about something called Rembrandt lighting. And basically it's a studio lighting technique where a small inverted triangle of light is visible on the subject's eye. So if you look right there, you can see that triangle. And that's what everyone considered uh, Rembrandt light. So that was fascinating. That's fine. And that was all good. But then I started hearing over and over again that Rembrandt was like the greatest thing since sliced bread, the most amazing artist of all time, perhaps the greatest portrait artist of all time. And I didn't get it. It's like, why? I mean, this little lighting pattern right here, this little triangle of light under, this is one of his images. Uh, oops, sorry. You can see it. Oops, I, did, I blew it. Okay. It's right underneath this right here. Uh, and it's like, what's the big deal? I don't get it. So the answer is that I started doing some research and all of a sudden I started seeing things like where Rodin, who's an incredibly famous French sculpture from turn of the century, actually 19th century. Um, he had a quote where he said, compare me with Rembrandt, what's sacrilege? Uh, that's big words for someone as famous as incredible of as Rodin, and again, he was about 200 years after Rembrandt. And then there was a guy by the name of Vincent van Gogh, who I'm sure most of you know, and he is quoted as saying with Rembrandt, the Colossus of Art, we should prostrate ourselves before Rembrandt and never compare anyone with him. And so what's he talking about? I don't get it. What's the big deal with it? it's a little triangle of light? Why is he so good and what makes him so different? So I started asking my colleagues, I asked uh, contemporaries and asked all sorts of different people. I said, he invented the triangle of light. It's like, I still didn't get it. And so I started researching deeper and started coming up with some different things. And then I now fully believe that he is as great as they say he was. And I'm gonna to try tonight to give you some examples of why that is. 
So um, again, here's that little triangle. And it's like, what's the big deal? I don't get it. So um, <clears throat> I started out by going back uh, in, actually there was a show maybe four years ago in Minnesota that they brought in every Rembrandt painting that they could get. They had like 60 Rembrandts there. And it was the first time I actually saw Rembrandt's early work. And <clears throat> ironically or otherwise, Rembrandt wasn't a prodigy by any means. He started out a little bit later in life, decided he wanted to be a painter. And so he studied under two different masters. Uh, and he, this is his early work, which is kind of not amazing. I mean, the color schemes are very different. The faces don't look realistic. As you go a little bit further along over here, the, the faces get a little bit better. But the proportions here really don't feel natural and correct. And so he started out just as an average uh, painter. So <clears throat> as you get here to about 1627, he is still kind of in that phrase or that phase. And then you get over here to 1631, all of a sudden he gets really good. And this is one of the ones I showed you before. And I should probably point out that <clears throat> um, these are what in the industry is known as cronies. Back in Amsterdam, if somebody was going to produce work and put it on display. So uh, I don't know what you guys have in Lancaster and Palmdale, but uh, they had in Amsterdam, and they're very common in different cities in the United States, they were, every Sunday they'd have little shows along the street where people could put their work out and people would stroll by and they'd try to sell work, etc. And so Rembrandt was actually from a town called Leiden, which is outside of Rembrandt, outside of Amsterdam. And so he decided he wanted to move to big time Amsterdam, which is, was at the time, one of the largest cities in the world and also one of the major economic centers of the world. So there was a lot of money, there was a lot of afflu affluence and he wanted to go make it big in the big city. So he went from Leiden and he went to Amsterdam, but he produced portfolio pieces. And so these would not have been, uh, portraits that he would done, had done for commissions or done for somebody, these would have been pieces that would show off his skill set. So you look here in uh, 1627, you see that he's doing the same thing that he was doing in 1631. Uh, so what you would do is you would try to show off what you could do with detail in the feathers, which is what you see here. Uh, metal is really difficult to render in painting. And so if you look at the skill set and actually doing uh, the rendering of this compared to what he's done here, which is, this is incredible, uh, then it's actually an example of how good he got. And then if you look at the expression, you look at the eyes, these eyes look a little bit too big, and this looks so believable and so accessible compared to this kind of mediocre image, and that's a difference of, what, four years? So um, he got really good, and this would have been part of the portfolio he would have taken uh, to Amsterdam to see if he could get work. So there was a transition that happened in between those, those years. Here's some better examples of this. Uh, you know, I should show you this just so you're aware. Look at the eyes. This is, by the way, a painting down at the Getty. Uh, it's, what, it's in their collection. It's not considered a major work because it was only a portfolio piece. But if you look at the believability, I mean, how he was able to render hair, the wetness or the moisture of the eye, how real it feels. There's a lot of different things going on here, skill set wise that was really incredible. So he went from this to this, and in between was this, and this is 1629. Uh, Rembrandt actually at that time had already taken on students. And so he was teaching other young artists to be how to paint. He had already been to at least one master and ultimately went on to another one called Peter Lastman. Uh, but he started doing paintings and this would be one that occurred um, that he made his, his students do. So what's interesting is that, oops, that's not one of his. Uh, this particular one is a is in Indianapolis of all places, kind of an obscure little painting and it took him years and years and years actually to verify that this is the correct one. There are lots of copies of this out there, uh, probably at least eight or so. It was painted when he was 23 years old and it was a transitional image that completely changed his style so much so as an educator, when I do something or find something that is kind of important, I will make my students repeat it and do it as a study or as a uh, example. And Rembrandt literally did this with his students. He actually had them 
uh, paint this. And there's like, again, eight copies of it because, uh, done by his students and they had a hard time verifying this was actually the original Rembrandt that they were copying. But this is a transitional image, a pivotal image, uh, which I'll show you later on exactly what was unique about it. Although when I first saw this image along my little path of finding out what Rembrandt did and what made him so significant, I looked at it and said, yeah, okay, that has none of the things that we consider important in uh, portraiture today. So for example, Larry, if I were to just enter this in one of the PPA print competitions, it might score 75 or 76, which means it's only average by most considerations. Uh, yet this is a pivotal image. So it, it's gonna be important later on to tell you why that is. I showed this to you because I don't know what you guys were doing when you were 21, 22, 23, but that's what I was doing. And that was me, long hair, and this probably looks like a lot of images you guys have. Andrew, you're not allowed to screen capture this and pass it around at school, just telling you. Um, but that was me. I was in uh, photography school and work, actually I was in a community college town in uh, Orange County. So let me show you again about specifically light. And this is what he was trying to do. There was a t or one of the things, major things that he did. Uh, by the way, it has nothing to do with the triangle, just telling you. There's something called tenebrism, and it's a really kind of an obscure little word. Not many people know about it. It's actually a style of painting. It's associated with an Italian painting, painter called Caravaggio. And if you don't have any art history, um, if you're really interested in a pivotal point in rendering figures, there's a guy by the name of Caravaggio you should look up. He started out in about the 1600s. It uh, really changed how people uh, portrayed individuals. Um, but anyway, it has a lot to do with how they're engulfed in shadows and it's very dramatic lighting. Uh, gen gen generally has to do with a beam of light, usually from an, an, identifi or an identifiable source, although not always. So this is the work of uh, Rembrandt, the early stuff I showed you before, and it has none of those characteristics until somewhere around 1626, he made a transition and it just changed him. And this is the work of Caravaggio. And if you see how deep the shadows are, how strong the beams of light coming across are, and the drama that's going on here. Um, if I were to translate this or compare it to what's going on <clears throat> in landscape photography, for example, um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the history of landscape photography, but there was a guy by the name of Watkins and uh, Moybridge also who photographed in Yosemite, which I'm sure you're familiar with, back in the late 1800s. And so those images had a lot to do with actually, Yellow, uh, I'm sorry, um, <coughs> Yosemite being set aside and preserved in the shape that it is now as a national park. But those images, if you were to compare those images to a guy by the name of Ansel Adams, who I know you all know, Ansel Adams photographed in many of the same spots and many of the same areas, and Adam's work was completely different than the early work and also completely different than pretty much anyone else photographing during this time frame. And what Adams did specifically was, <clears throat> uh, specifically with the Yosemite work, you'll see that there's strong beams of light. He waited till after the uh, big storms and the lights were streaking through the clouds and the shadows were really, really deep and powerful because he did it through things like the zone system and he did it through filtration with red filters and the rest but he wanted his work to be incredibly dramatic. And so he actually took some of the same principles that Caravaggio used um, to make his work that much more powerful. And so literally, if you look at Caravaggio's work, it very much has a very theatrical type of look. And so that was the change that Caravaggio gave us. And you can see it over and over again. If you're familiar with the work of George Harrell uh, or Joseph Karsh, um, they are photographers that kind of took that same principle in that drama and the blacks and the beams of light and turned it into portrait world as well. So here's Rembrandt, uh, 1628, 1629. And you notice the beam of light coming across. You notice the very deep shadows. You notice areas where there's a beam of light not illuminating it exactly the same all the way across. The hat's different, the hair's different, the body's different. Uh, that was a major change for him. It became a stylistic consideration that um, separated him from other people. The question is, is where did he get it? And that's still actually very controversial. 
There are people that have lots of different opinions about that. Turns out that Peter Lastman, who actually, it's pretty well documented that Rembrandt never saw Caravaggio painting. Caravaggio was in Italy. Uh, Rembrandt was in Amsterdam. And he never studied with Caravaggio. So where did he learn how to do this? Peter Lastman, uh, who was the last person he studied with, Rembrandt studied with, uh, had studied with Caravaggio. But apparently Lastman and Rembrandt didn't get along. And so Rembrandt lost really early, left really early. And so most people don't think he learned it from him. There was a group of painters. It would be the equivalent from LA to uh, Lancaster. There was a town called Utrecht. And Utrecht was where there was a group of what they call Caravaggio or Caravaggioists. And they were uh, students or followers of Caravaggio. And he probably saw the work there, but he adopted it in that strong, dramatic, powerful beams of light approach is, again, his signature that came around to, at that time. And you can see it, here's an image in 32, uh, where there's a beam of light coming across here. If I can move it this way. You can see a beam of light that, ooh, you can see a beam of light. You can see a beam of light. I think you can see a beam of light. Yeah, the beam of light that comes across here, it comes across here, and it comes across here. Uh, it doesn't really hit this area down here. You can even see it only hits the hand just partially. Uh, and so that's his signature. Very dark areas, very high contrast, very powerful uh, play of light in his work. And it came from Caravaggio. So here's another example. These are three painters that were kind of contemporaries, definitely contemporaries here. And Rubens was a little bit before him. I hope you know the work of Rubens. Probably don't know the work of Halls. These guys were major competitors in the same town. And Rembrandt, you can see with, this is an Agatha Baths painting. See the beam of light coming across here? It comes across here. This is what I call global lighting. There's no beams of light. It's just evenly illuminated all the way across. And even with Peter Paul Rubens, you can see there is a little bit of the hats casting a little bit of shadow on the face, but it's a, uh, there's no beam of light. And so, and it's also look at the darks. They're not at all uh, like what you would see in a, a Rembrandt over here. Again, these people, both Halls and Rembrandt worked in the same neighborhoods. I mean, they were, both worked in Amsterdam, had the same clients. And you can see that when you came to Rembrandt, you got something completely different than you got with the Halls. Here's another thing that's kind of significant about this, and this would relate to pretty much any discipline in photography. Um, you got to know your audience. You got to know your clientele. So at the time in Amsterdam, it was a rather conservative religious community. And so you can tell that in the clothing. Uh, you can tell it in the colors that they wore. You can tell it about the dresses and how the necklaces and the necklines and all the rest of it. Uh, compared to Rubens, who was originally from uh, Holland, but he went and he started photographing painting kings and queens. And you can see, uh, you would never see cleavage like this in Amsterdam. You would never see these colors in Amsterdam. Look at the blues back here, et cetera. That's all part of a completely different look. And it sold to the clientele that Rubens worked for, but it would never sell where Rembrandt worked. Which that is critical to know. Um, a lot of my work, by the way, as a landscape artist, actually has a very Southwest feel. And so it does well in the Southwest, but it doesn't do well in the Western United States, along 395 or even in Los Angeles area. All right, so here's probably one of his more famous <coughs> paintings that I watch. And you can see the beams of light coming across. Uh, and you can see the illumination here, really excellent example of that. Uh, by the way, this is also for then those of you that uh, do photography or wear photography, this was a portrait commission for a group. And then you compare the groups that we do now, how we stack them up like cords of wood and we make really nice compositions and all the rest. He, Rembrandt certainly did that kind of work and it was done during this time also. But this period in painting, they had some of the more creative approaches to group portraiture that ever has been. And, I mean, it was also interesting is that Rembrandt would charge more money to have people up front. And so this little guy back here uh, didn't pay as much to get his portrait done and barely see his face. So that's kind of the, the type of things that would happen there with that. Another interesting thing is that Rembrandt was purely 
there's always been an ebb and flow. It's really only been the last, I don't know how many decades, that Rembrandt's been incredibly popular and done well. Henry Peach Robinson is a very famous, uh, originally a painter, and he ultimately went on to be a photographer, and he was early 1900s. Uh, I read a book of his. He was talking about pictorial effect in photography, by the way, landscape photography and some of the other things. And so he was talking about Rembrandt, and he goes, in the case of the pictures of Rembrandt, how often they're ill-drawn, always vulgar choice of form. So <clears throat> in his mind, Rembrandt was often ill-drawn and always vulgar in, ch in choice of form. To me, that seems inconceivable, but okay. But he does go on to say, but a priceless value for their marvelous chiaroscuro and the alchemy of his art transforming dross into pure gold. Chiaroscuro, by the way, is uh, a broad term for light and shadow. And so most people will define this as chiaroscuro, but um, light and shadow can be used in very less dramatic ways. And so this is kind of like chiaroscuro on steroids. And Peach Robinson uh, recognizes that Rembrandt is really known for that power of lighting that he brings to the table. So I've got two pieces here of my work that are kind of done in that style. This is kind of my approach to doing Rembrandt style work without people dressed in Rembrandt style costumes. And so you can see the strong beams of light coming across here, strong beams of light coming across here, um, and the darker backgrounds, a higher contrast, uh, that type of thing. That's very typical of what he did, and that's kind of my modern interpretation of it. Let's see here. Um, and can we get rid of that? We can get rid of that. Okay. So I already used this term for you already, and it's one I've made up. You'll never see it if you Google it. And I mean, I've never seen these two words together, but it's how I use, uh, it's a terminology I use to describe light that is similar from top to bottom, and it doesn't have any uniqueness across it. Um, <clears throat> so I call it homogeneous light. So there isn't that beam of light coming across. It's evenly illuminated, even though it has a sense of direction. And so an example of that, however, and, Ansel Adams would be an excellent example of that, where Adams had strong direction in his light, but the <clears throat> he had beams of light coming in. Uh, there's a very famous image of uh, Adams, which is done, I believe, in Lone Pine, which has Whitney behind it with the Alabama hills in front of it in silhouette and has a horse in a pasture with a beam of light on the horse. Classic tenorism uh, with beams of light coming in. And that was, again, a signature of what Rem or what Adams did using the same technique in uh, landscape versus portraiture. So this is a work of Vermeer, and hopefully you're familiar with his work as well, very famous. Window light, light coming across, uh, not near the contrast level, and it's not the beams of light coming across, it's just all the light coming from the same direction. So this is incredibly beautiful stuff, but not in the sense of Caravaggio and or Rembrandt, it's a different style. This is the very beginnings, actually, probably not. This is 50 years after the beginnings of photography. But uh, this is a studio from about 1908. And um, what's interesting, we talk as artists a lot about natural light and especially portrait artists and how much we like it. But I doubt any of you have studios that look like this. And it has to do with direction of light because we almost always had light coming from windows from the side here, but they built studios literally that the light was coming in predominantly from above like that. And you notice they have these, what we call flags here to shape the light. And they had flags over here to shape the light and then reflectors here. It's amazing how sophisticated this image from 1908 was uh, in, in their lighting. Yet <clears throat> um, we think we're really sophisticated using natural light. And these guys were doing four or five levels beyond what uh, we would do today. So it's pretty interesting. I'm going to take you back, homogeneous light. That last example I gave you was homogeneous light, but they were cutting it up a little bit so that it became a little more defined. I showed you this before with Agatha, Agatha Bass. And what I want to show you is that uh, the light in the face is actually very different than the light here on the dress and very different than the light going down here on the hand. Uh, <clears throat> I first saw this image on my honeymoon 14 years ago. Um, I was a smart man and took my wife to Paris on the honeymoon but also went to Amsterdam because it was like the 500th year anniversary of Rembrandt doing something. I don't know what it was, but went to a studio. This happened to be on display 
at the um, gallery there, which was actually in Rembrandt's house. You can still go visit Rembrandt's house uh, and his studio there, which is a really, if you're interested in it, go there. It's because it's pretty compelling. There's lots of stuff to be seen there. But they had borrowed this image from, I believe it's Windsor Gallery uh, in England, and they brought it over and had it on display when I went there. And so I looked at it and I spent some time with it. And I, I, I love the image and I just thought there were some really amazing things going on. But what I didn't understand, once I spent a little more time with it, any of that have worked with next to the window light or any light with directional, you all know that whatever the direction is, if it's coming in, if it's coming in over here, from that direction, uh, this side over here is gonna be brighter than this side over here, right? Well, I couldn't understand why this hand, this sleeve was brighter than this over here and this down here. And so what is it that made that happen? And the answer is that there's a beam of light that comes across the face, just skims past this and actually hits this area here. And it hits this area here because it's a little bit farther forward. So this area behind is just a little bit back, just enough so that you have this kind of beams of light things going on here. And that was one of the epiphany moments for me realizing that he did things that were completely different than everyone else. And so if you go in and you look closer at the work, you'll see that in any of that photograph product or shiny things, cars, uh, airplanes or whatever, know that the character of light changes depending upon the shape of the light source. So direct sunlight creates really harsh, bright specular highlights or white areas within it. And so the, um, this looks like this is from a relatively large source like a window, but large windows produce very soft shadows like this, as opposed to this very harsh shadow going around here, and this very harsh shadow going around here. So painters get to lie and make things up. So the lighting on the face is completely different. Look at the shadow here than the lighting on the outfit. And even this over here, the pearls, once you were in complete shade over here, you wouldn't have the specular highlights or the shiny parts on the pearls exactly as you see them over here. So I got upset with painters because they get the lion sheet. We now get the lion sheet in, in Photoshop, um, but the, in post-production, but it was really kind of interesting that all of a sudden, instead of having one light source, one shape of light, one look of light, or ho <clears throat> homogeneous light, it actually is beams of light used in different ways throughout the image. And so it actually helped me to understand um, some other things. And so I looked at the work of a guy by the name of John Singer Sargent, who is also somebody who's really incredible. And if you look closely, the lighting on the face is completely different than the lighting on the outfit. And he could do that because he's allowed to. Uh, because he's not tied to reality like we are. Oops, my bad. Uh, you can see that this type of lighting would have been from a very large light source, and this type of lighting would have been from a much smaller, uh, more specular light source. And so it changed how I photographed because I started figuring out how, they, how I could emulate that in... Uh, my work, and so that's how I came up with images like this. So this happens to be an image that I went in and tried to make look like a Rembrandt. Um, it's actually a, in, it's done very well in print competition. Uh, so Larry, for example, this went is one of my lone images. And it's of a little girl, I'll show you the original, I'll show you what I did later to it. But the lighting on the hand is very different than the lighting on the face. And here's another example, this was actually done with window light. If you look at the lighting on the outfit, the lighting on the arms and the belly here, and you look at the lighting in the face, it's a very different look. You can see the shininess. This is called specular highlights. And there's a glow to this that does not exist anywhere else on the body. And then that would be an example of what I call uh, non-homogeneous light. So, um, <clears throat> I like the play with different light sources. And that's one of the things I'm known for in the studio. 
So these two images were done you know, for demonstrations uh, up in Oregon, as a matter of fact. And so there are two different models, obviously a Nazi officer here and a young girl. <clears throat> and so these were done with exactly the same light. It's a very large umbrella. And uh, Andrew, you learned how to do this in our class. Um, but the idea being is that this is a very soft, beautiful, homogenous light source. And then this is done with exactly the same light. But you notice that there's a beam of light on the face and on the shoulder here. And the rest of it, there is no beam of light. Again, done with one light. There's no background light. Um, it's just all about knowing how to be creative and using tools in unique ways. By the way, neither one of those is better or worse than the other because of the style of lighting. They are what they are. But here I wanted, I had a beautiful gal that I wanted to flatter and do in a very typical approach to that style of work. Um, by the way, you'll notice this, I actually turned the flash off on this and used the modeling light. This is shot at 1.8 underneath five millimeter lens so that you can see this shallow depth of field here. And that was part of the look I was looking for. And so when I had him as a model on exactly the same background and light, I didn't want to do that soft, fuzzy, wonderful, romantic thing. I wanted the harshness, I wanted the drama. So the flash actually was set off with this. I think that this was shot about F8, but what I did with the lighting uh, is completely different, but I wanted the sharpness, I wanted the drama. Okay, another thing that Rembrandt was known for, and if you talk to painters, uh, a painter would never know about the triangle of light uh, that we photographers think of as Rembrandt lighting. Matter of fact, it's only photographers that have to use that terminology. And <clears throat> I haven't even been able to find out who came up with that concept. It's buried in history somewhere. Um, but the Rembrandt was known for his dramatic lighting, high chiaroscuro, and also for his expression from painters. In this image here is a really good example. Again, this is a transitional image uh, wrong button, I apologize again. Um, it's that transitional image. And there's a couple things going on here. One, he started experimenting with expression. And as you look at Rembrandt's expressions throughout his career, he was very well known for what he did with uh, expressions. And they were so much more believable uh, than anyone else. And this is where he first started experimenting with this. Also, he started experimenting with rendering skin in a more believable way. So this is him and this is him with blemishes at that age, which were very common and a stuffy uh, skin tonality. So that was another aspect of this that was so pivotal for him. He changed how we rendered things to from a less idealized to a more interpretive uh, and art correct style, I guess for lack of a better term. So not only was it, not only was the lighting different, but uh, what he did with expression in reality of the skin was uh, <clears throat> different also. Again, that was at 23. Here's some other examples. This is also done during, during that same time frame um, where he was playing with expression. And you can see it later on in his work as well. So what I did is I took some paintings done by Rembrandt and brought them in real close. And um, what he was able to render was his people look like they're right between expressions or they, the skin tonality looks real in a way that is even better than what we call photorealism. Uh, there's just an aspect to what he did with expression and how he rendered skin and eyes and all the rest that made his people look like they were just like right there, which is very different than what other people were able to achieve, which is why clients came to him and paid premium dollars uh, to have him portray them. And that would be a self-portrait of him later on in life. These are two images later on in life also. And this is from that, again, very difficult period of life. And you see the empathy and the emotion, maybe some of the turmoil going on in his life here. Uh, you can see the furrowed brow. And you can see lots of different things going on here. This is such a great example. But it's not just a snapshot. It's a, you can almost see past the eyes and feel uh, what he's going through. And then again, that was very typical of the work that he did for his clients. Then there's something called edges. And uh, as photographers, we know about shallow depth of field uh, and we use that extensively. 
Landscape photography, we often use it for uh, a lot of depth of field because we want a lot of different things sharp. But I kind of had always known about that, but it became really clear to me that um, there's a couple other different things going on. I, you may have heard this um, phraseology wise uh, in my circle, uh, especially for, uh, photographers in PPA types, they will always tell you the lightest area of the image is the one that has the most interest. And so you always want to darken whatever your main subject is, you want everything else in your image to be darker than that main subject. And so again, that's how I was taught, that's how I was trained. I, it's been uh, maybe 10, 15 years since I was on my way up to uh, Washington to give a program up there, stopped overnight in Portland. And you know how when you go into hotels, they have those little flyers uh, about places to go and things to see in the town. It was like two o'clock in the morning. It was really, really late. But uh, I was waiting for the person to do whatever they were doing behind the desk. And I looked over and I saw that there was a exhibition of John Singer Sargent work, who again, is a, I'm a big fan of his work. Um, <clears throat> as an example for, <clears throat> so you can get an idea. These are huge. They're uh, 15, uh, 10 feet by 20 feet or something like that. They're really large canvases. Uh, he worked early 1900s, 1905, 1901, etc. And he was a well-paid portrait commission artist. Um, also a very interesting study for a variety of different reasons. He got kicked out of Paris, got kicked out of England for controversial reasons. But um, this, I turned to a corner and saw this image. And it kind of blew me away for a variety of different reasons. Uh, to finish my thought about <clears throat> a comparison, if you were this particular canvas... Uh, was done in 1880s. And if they, the person that commissioned him at his height, John Singer Sargent, they would pay <clears throat> um, $100,000 for a portrait commission like this from him in 1880s, 1900s. Uh, the equivalent of that today would be about 1.5 million for someone to do a painting like that. So obviously he was very highly regarded and um, was paid very well for his work. But I saw this image and it just kind of belied everything I'd ever heard. First off, the brightest part is the collar over here and then the dress here, but that's not the subject at all. And so why does my eye go to his face? Why, when you get and look at this girl, all of a sudden is she so incredibly important? And part of it is edges. And part of it is, and I give this example later on in a different program, but it's called what I call the visual hierarchy. And lightness in an image is not necessarily the most important part. Our eye does go to the light area, but we also look for contrast. Contrast is incredibly important. If you're talking about cinematography or movies, movement is incredibly important. But contrast, um, <clears throat> lightness, and then final hi hierarchy of where things are is sharpness. And if you look at this image, everything in this image is somewhat soft. Like there's a tremendous amount of information going on here but it's not super sharp and it's certainly not super high contrast compared to the contrast here. If you look, even the face, the area where the contrast is, is right here. And that's where the sharpness is. And so you can go through this incredibly large cam canvas and you always end up here and you always end up here because of his control of edges. And I thought, well, that's cool. And then, some of you that have seen my work before, uh, I talk about the history of painting, et cetera. This was an image done at 100 AD. And that was like 2000 plus years ago, almost 2000 years ago. And the um, most people don't realize that what they thought they learned in the Renaissance was actually well known to the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians before the advent of the Middle Ages or Byzantine era. And so they knew how to do everything that we know now and took them decades to learn again from the 1300s on at the beginning of the Renaissance. But they knew about where the catch lights should be in the eye. They knew about reflected light. They knew about contrast. They knew about shadows, singular direction of light, highlight shadows, etc. And they also knew about softness of edges and depth of field. Um, again, we do it with depth of field the painters get to cheat because painters get to actually do it not on planes um, in front and behind whatever you focus on, 
but they get to put the information wherever they want to. So this is done with a 1.885 millimeter lens again. And so, yeah, I have the focus on the front eye, cute as a button little girl, nice lighting, all the rest. But a painter might do it differently. So actually, believe it or not, John Singer Sargent with his $100,000 commissions got bored doing paintings and it took him so long to do them that uh, he was just totally over it. And so he started doing sketches of people and he was able to do them more quickly. And um, that's how he satiated the people that wanted to get images by him. But this is the sketches, which I just recently discovered. I hadn't seen them. Uh, maybe I'd seen them, but I'd forgotten about them. But then when I understood the concept of edges, all of a sudden I started to realize that uh, if you look at this image, everything in here is soft, including the hair, et cetera, until you get here. So could we do that with depth of field? Yes, but painters don't do it on planes. They do it more selectively. When I saw Rembrandt's work again, I went back and realized he's been doing the same thing since the 1600s. So this was a, an idea that was not new to anything that we did, except they did it in different ways. And so there were, this is an example uh, from a book that I have about Rembrandt that is like the book on Rembrandt and they talk about so many different things. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, this is a comparison. This is a Rembrandt image. And you can see how similar the dress is and how similar the subject matter is. And this is the Rembrandt image on the left. And this is another one, uh, Pickanoy, I think is the name of the artist. I'll sh it'll come up again. But, uh, and, and the tonality of this is probably because of the, the varnish is getting a little bit crazy and this has probably been cleaned. But there is a believability to the face here that doesn't seem to be existing here. And so when you go in really close, and by the way, this particular section of the book is really interesting because the, he was talking about the conventions and tools that uh, the Dutch knew how to use during that time period. There wasn't an awful lot of things that Rembrandt was doing that was that innovative or that unique, except for this. And so uh, if you go in closer, pick an oil over here, you can see that everything is rendered modeled very clearly and sharply. And if you look at Rembrandt's work, it's much looser. The edges are softer. The, uh, they're not as crisp in all the areas, except for this area in here. And then look what he did with specular highlights. He had highlights here that actually, in the, they, they knew how to put a rendering of the, the moisture in the eye here, but they, Rembrandt did it in the skin. There's a moistness to the skin and there's a depth to the skin that doesn't exist over here. And so he did it with detail and with lack of detail. And so if you look really closely, the Rembrandt figure appears to be much more alive. And it looks as if at any point she could change her expression or you could have a conversation with her. Whereas with the Picanoi, you would look at it and go, yeah, that's a very nice rendering of the individual, but they don't look alive. And Rembrandt's work did because of the looseness that he used in that concept of edges. I went on to learn that uh, during the 1800s, they were fixated on this concept, totally on this concept about, uh, about how loose edges were and how to define edges. And they, they did a tremendous amount of work with it. So I started studying it a little bit. And here's an example of how um, I started to apply it. So this is the image straight out of camera that I shot. And so again, the light on the face is a little bit different than the light on the body, but I accentuated it a little bit. But more importantly, what I did is when I saw this image, um, there was a mechanical perfection that came from the camera. It was a 36 megapixel camera at F8, whatever it was, and there was sharpness through everything. And for me to have it look more painterly, I had to subtract some of that information. So I was looking for ways of doing that. And literally what I ended up doing is literally what I ended up doing Lost it. There. Is taking things like if you look at this area, um, you see how the collar is sharp all the way throughout. You see how the doily on her head is sharp all the way across. And uh, even the sharpness in the face and also specifically the sharpness of the dress. And I went in here and I created a layer in Photoshop 
and I softened it with Gaussian blur, then I masked it back so that I did effectively shallow depth of field, but I did it not on a plane, but I did it in areas where I wanted less attention. So even though this would have been perhaps on the same plane as the front of the dress here, uh, which would have even using shallow depth of field, I could have achieved that, but the, um, by doing it this way selectively, it gave me much more control with the idea being that I was able to draw people's attention where I wanted it to be. So let me give you another example right here. So here's an image I showed you before. So this is my way of kind of emulating uh, a Rembrandt style image. By the way, this was captured in a four by five inch uh, color negative film. But what I did is I did that same technique. So here's the actual image, sharp, front to back, everything's the same. And there's nothing wrong with either one of them. But if I go in close, you can see now that I've softened this area here. I softened the collar, softened the outfit. Because I took, when our eye craves sharpness and contrast. And so my eye was spending way too much time down here. And the it didn't take me where I wanted to go because I wanted to end up right here. So I pulled back the sharpness in some of the other areas. And I did it at different values. Or, levels of intensity um, in different spots. So it wasn't just a straight layer. <clears throat> I changed some of those levels. And so it came with, and out to look like this. And I discovered something I didn't know. I, I kind of knew it, but I didn't. Um, landscape photographers, you should all know about something called atmospheric perspective. Things that are further away go through more air, so they're lower contrast. They're not as sharp. The edges are not as sharp. They tend to be bluer. Uh, there's a variety of things that happen. Things that, that you know, in the foreground tend to be sharper, they tend to be crisper uh, and warmer. And so our brain equates that to that things that are sharper are farther for, are for the, further forward and things that are softer are further away. And so if you look at these and if you flip back and forth between them, look how flat he looks here and look at how three-dimensional it looks here and look how it feels like his face is pushing forward than this area here. So you might have to spend a little bit of time to see that, but to me, it's really obvious. And when you saw this originally, it didn't, you, you wouldn't have recognized it. Yet it's my way of controlling ever so subtly what is going on, how this is my way of controlling where your eye goes and what, where I want my center of interest to be. So if I'm gonna relate that to other disciplines, you all use shallow depth of field uh, for a variety of different reasons and very effectively, I'm sure. I will tell you in landscape photography, I'm sorry, landscape painting, they have used this technique of not uh, linear atmospheric perspective, but by controlling areas of sharpness and detail, especially since the Impressionist work, uh, later 1800s, they have been using this particular technique of edges to make their work look that much more three-dimensional. And I've started doing that in my landscape work also it's almost not, you've got to do it really subtly and you have to do it so it makes sense. But um, one of the things about photography is that it can be so sharp, it can be so detailed that sometimes we, our, our eye doesn't know where to go. And so one of the means at which you can control uh, attention is by softening some areas that you want less attention and then sharpening areas and adding contrast to areas where you want more attention. Then there's something called impasto. And impasto is the idea of <clears throat> laying paint on in thick layers. Um, we don't have an equivalent of this in photography. We try to, we try to use, use different brush strokes and we try to create a lot of different effects like that. But if you actually see a painting uh, versus a photograph where, because we are working on a two dimensional substrate uh, we can do some amazing things, but there is no way we can compare it uh, to what could be achieved in a three-dimensional medium like painting. So let me give you some examples. You probably know the work of Van Gogh, and you know that his brushstrokes, as well as his color, and his, et cetera, was, had a lot to do with what he um, was trying to express, and there was such power, uh, and a very frenetic, and really pretty inc incredible imagery. 
And again, this does not translate into literally what uh, the experience is of seeing this in person. But we're back at this Rembrandt guy. And what did I learn from Rembrandt? What did Rembrandt do that made him so unique? Um, so I already showed you what he did with the lighting, not the triangle, but the, the tenebrism and the chiaroscuro. I showed you what he did with edges, uh, which is again, very much far forward in, in advance of his time. And I showed you what he did with expression. And then this is another thing he did with um, impasto. So during Rembrandt's era, they would try specifically to hide the brushstrokes. They made, they painted over and over again and brushstrokes themselves generally were not considered things that you wanted to see. They wanted it to look photorealistic, even though they didn't have photographs, but they wanted it to look like it was, you were there in person. So brushstrokes were not of what they were doing. Rembrandt, and there were other painters that literally started doing work like this. Um, he was certainly not the first. A Titian, who was somebody who studied a lot, uh, was somebody who did this work also. But Rembrandt took it to a whole new level and in a different way. So he started, for example, doing things like, well, you know what, let me just show you some more examples of what they were trying to achieve. You can't see a single brushstroke in this image at all. And this is a painting, so it's really beautiful stuff. And so all of a sudden Rembrandt went from that and started adding depth and brushstroke to it. Now this is also in a painting, a painting you can see at the Getty Museum uh, in Los Angeles. And it's called the um, St. Bartholomew, done in 1661 later on in his life. And ironically, Rembrandt was experimenting with this softness, um, looseness is what they called it back then, uh, a loose brushstroke, et cetera. Uh, and he was experimenting with it. And as he got older and older, uh, he started using it more and more extensively. And a lot of people thought, well, he's losing his ability to render things smoothly. And it was just the opposite of that. He wanted to use his paintings and brushstrokes in a way that had a tremendous amount of impact. And so you saw the looseness that he had before, which I showed you back uh, in the earlier work, but now he's taken it to another degree. And he started to take information away from areas and he started to use looser brush strokes. If you know the work of Cezanne, Cezanne later on in, in the Impressionist era, just past the Impressionist era, started doing the same things and trying to figure out how little information could you give your viewer and still have them understand what you're trying to do. Um, Rembrandt kind of started working that same way and he also started working with layers of paints and dashes of color that would render them in a way that were, was completely different than anyone else was doing. Um, there is a quote by Rembrandt saying that, uh, he was telling people, don't get too close because you'll get overwhelmed with the fumes of the paint. And what he was trying to say is that his images look better when they're a little bit further away. And when you get in too close, you start actually looking at uh, the brushstrokes themselves and it becomes less important. Look, even in this area over here, how it's like hatchwork, almost like hatchwork. And it's really amazing how it was rendered. There's a particular painting here called The Jewish Bride. If you go to Amsterdam uh, Reich's Museum, this is like the third room in. And um, it's really an amazing piece done by Rembrandt. Uh, it's about a husband and bride. Um, this is obviously not one of the poses we would do today with a husband and bride, but it was a very tender moment <clears throat> that um, he rendered here. Now, what was interesting though, there's a story about a young painter by the name of Van Gogh, who actually went with, I believe his brother or his friend to this museum, to this gallery, <clears throat> and they were walking through. Uh, Van Gogh stopped here, his friend went on. His friend went on and went like two hours through the museum and could not figure out where um, Van Gogh was. And it turns out that Van Gogh had literally planted himself in front of this painting, had not moved from it, in that two to three hour period. And so he was completely enamored with it. Uh, if you look closely at the sleeve, look at the sleeve here, look at the amount of layer of paint and the layering of paint there. He did things here that a lot of people still don't understand what he did and how he did it, but it was almost sculptural in the depth of the layering of paint on this. And it takes place in 
not only the sleeve here, but it takes place in the hand over here. And again, you can see this looseness here. You can see it over in the fabric over here. Again, it's not rendered realistically. It's actually more sculptural. And so when you get <clears throat> past that, this is the quote from Van Gogh. Uh, in his letters, he wrote that Van Gogh was reduced to the tears in front of the Jewish bride, writing that he would gladly, gladly give up 10 years of his life to sit in front of the painting for two weeks, eating only a stale crust of bread. He wanted to understand what he was doing, how he was doing it, and why he was doing it. And in later readings, I found out that Van Gogh was so humbled by what he saw that he went immediately and started studying how to do this. And this again became his vocabulary and his style. Ink annotations. Wow, that was wild. Sorry. So actually we got us to here. And then the last one was the Van Gogh quote. With Rembrandt, the Colossus of Art, we should prostrate ourselves before Rembrandt and never compare anyone with him. That's how enamored he was with him. So um, that was the rabbit hole I went down. And there's a couple other things I've learned about Rembrandt. In, in, I could talk about his business acumen, about what he did with um, his whole lifestyle and all sorts of different things. But I'm going to stop it there and see what questions you might have, or if you wanna go down different rabbit holes, because I can take you down lots of rabbit holes. I didn't, nobody gave me any questions, but if you wanna unmute yourself and ask Tim questions you might have about these, what he said so far. Oh, it was either that good or that bad. No, I, I totally get the, like, your eye being drawn to the edges mm -hmm. and making certain areas softer to keep your eye from going there. Uh, I feel like that's something that I didn't know I did, but I think I do. <laughs> so that was kind of a cool uh, idea that's different than light and dark, using light and dark to draw the eye but also mm -hmm. soft and sharp. It's, it's really good because that's something that's applicable across portraits, landscapes, any still life, anything that you want to use to use the, draw the eye to a certain place. Yeah, softening, that, that technique of softening around there to draw a focus down to the sharpest point is something that would be interesting for me to experiment with, which I have never done. I, have done, I don't do a lot of portraiture, but I've been thinking about going into it. So I thought this would be a good example to, 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 to work with. How do other artists compare to Rembrandt as far as the, the realism of their light sources? I mean, you were explaining how he was being very realistic and faithful to how his pictures were lighted. Where, uh, was he unusual for that, or were other artists pay that great of attention to that detail? Well, actually, um, he was a liar. <laughs> In <laughs> other words, he didn't, what, what was actually there was not how he rendered it. So when he rendered the dress, he made things up compared to what he had done with the lighting on the face. So he wasn't really faithful to what was in front of him. He was actually more interpretive if that makes sense. And the beauty of his work and what made him unique was that um, he, well, let me use an example. So I talked about softness, using softness as a way of um, softening areas so that you, your eye would go back to the, the, the higher contrast, sharper areas. I think I made that point relatively well. But he actually started going beyond that. So in other words, uh, he would do things with hands where the hands didn't look actually even realistic at all. They looked like clubs and they didn't look, they weren't rendered perfectly. And so people were saying that, you know, this guy's losing it. But what he was doing was pulling detail away 
from the from the work so that the areas that were sharper would pop even more. So it's kind of like volume. You can go ahead and raise the volume behind the background noise, or you can keep the volume the same and make the background noise even more confusing. So this stands out more. He did that same thing. He raised the intensity of the contrast on the faces, et cetera, by using specular highlights, by using looseness, et cetera. But then he also took the bottom level down so that, and that's why his um, uh, Bartholomew image was rendered so incredibly loose. Uh, so he actually really did extreme things there. How many are you familiar with the work of uh, Turner, the landscapes by Turner? Seen some. Uh, Kate, you are good. Um, the, you guys should look at the landscapes of Turner. Uh, Turner, let me see if I can pull one up. Landscape photographers have an incredibly um, broad spectrum also. I talked a little bit about that. But let me see if I can pull up a Turner. I bet you I can go in and put in Turner here. And if you ever go to, uh, there's a Turner and we're gonna do painting. Turner painter, there we go, PA. Ta-da. There we go. So um, look at his skies. He was 1800s, I think, but landscape photographer. And you can see the looseness in here, but what Turner did with skies and landscapes are insane. And he's considered one of the greatest landscape painters of all time. Uh, and they talk about Turner skies uh, because of the location. But we have some really amazing landscapes out here, but we tend, uh, especially sunsets during this time of year, but the, um, how he rendered them and what he did with them is really incredible. So that you see that, again, there's that kind of looseness thing going on here, and you'll see areas of higher contrast through here. They're doing exactly the same thing that this is the area of highest contrast. Uh, these are contrasting colors. You can see what's being done compositionally, but you can see what's being done with uh, the control of those edges. Uh, really, really well done. I, but I, I guess my point is that, um, and let me pull up another guy. There was a guy that uh, Watkins, who was the guy who started doing the work photographically in uh, Yosemite, he was influenced by a guy by the name of Bierstadt. Here we go. And these are the Yosemite images that Bierstadt did that as photographers, mm -hmm. we looked at those and we go, well, we can't do that. Now, what Watkins learned from Bierstadt was <clears throat> foreground elements, leading lines, all the stuff you guys talk about on a regular basis. This is Bierstadt's work in Yosemite. Look at the skies, by the way. By the way, during that time of um, photography, they didn't have a way of rendering skies because the uh, skies wouldn't render. They had to do two different exposures because they had uh, orthochromatic film versus panchromatic film. But um, see the beams of light coming in, a la Ansel Adams. Mm. And so, uh, and look at that, the use of light, etc. And so this is not homogeneous light. This is, that's probably a little closer. These were done in the 1800s. So what Watkins learned from Bierstadt was composition, framing, foreground, middle ground, background. Uh, by the way, notice how the mountains here are softer and the, the impact, et cetera. And if I take that same principle and go to, So guess who influenced him? Bierstadt. Oh. See the beams of light coming through? He waited till storms had gone through. And that's why his work looks so different than everybody else's. Use the shape and form, which comes from the modernist era. 
uh, where is, actually this is a semi, I should do long time. There it is. Probably one of those most famous images. Whitney, cool. Alabama Hills, storm had passed. Actually, Andrew did an image very similar to this up at Manzanar. Uh, he didn't have the beams of light, but he understood how to get the lighting on the mountains. Uh, congratulations. But you see the beam of light coming down on the horse? Non-homogeneous light, very much like Caravaggio. And also Bierstadt and uh, so there's a lot that you can learn from painting and some of those different ideas. And actually, even in this image, uh, you can see that the sharpest area in this image is right here. Now, this is atmospheric perspective at its best. But um, this, everything comes down here because of the sharpness. And that's not a really good example of it. I don't know if I have a very good example of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you were talking about looseness uh, in the later Rembrandt work. How would that translate into photography? Like, is that possible to do? Well, we don't think we can't do it. Well, okay. We can do brushstrokes. You can, the right. technique that I used, you could do that also um, <clears throat> with the softness. The truth is that uh, photography is such a mechanical process and our cameras are getting better and better and better. Again, I shoot with an eight by 10 inch camera. And um, one of the reasons I still shoot with film versus digital is because digital is too sharp. And the way it sharpens is not unnatural. Digital doesn't sharpen the stuff in between, it sharpens the edges. Film sharpens things continuously. So it has an organic feel to it. That's why I use it. Um, the, but, When I started trying to do that one image of the little girl, I realized immediately I had to find ways of eliminating information and getting rid of things. You have someone coming in that's going to be doing, um, I think you said overlays. Right. And so, um, hold on here. Um, where's, here I have it up here. So this is that same little girl. And it was at a time when I was trying to figure out how to, if Rembrandt were to do a photograph or a painting today, how would it look and what techniques would he use? And so I kind of gathered up all the pieces of information that I had in all the research that I had done and kind of came up with some of these different approaches. And so if I take this all the way down to here, that was the original image. And it, including the, a clamp holding your dress together. This is just a paper uh, collar. That's kind of like a doily or whatever it is. Uh, and that's just fabric held together. And it was actually just a lighting demo that, that I was doing, I put it together. But I did the basic retouching, boom, got rid of this. But it was still too much information. And so I had to figure out ways of getting rid of some of that information. So what I did was the one technique where I did the softness, oh, let's see here, let's go to here. Let me get rid of all this. And so I did the softness. Uh, let's see here. And then I also added a texture to it by way of an overlay. And what textures do, um, this obviously is a painting texture. And so I literally uh, started adding backgrounds. Where is it here? So uh, here's the blur. It's gonna be rid of some of the stuff. Yeah. Okay, so this is what I do with the blur. 
you should see what I did with that. I basically did a Gaussian blur, then I put a mask on it, and then I took out areas. That's the whole Gaussian blur, and then I started to control it. Then I wanted to add a background to break it up, and I did it with an overlay. And so this is a free overlay you can get from Photoshop. So it has kind of a painterly feel to it, and I added another one on top, and it uh, really adds that there too. Now, so I have since gone in, I have too much going on in the face here. And so literally I would go in with a brush and paint it out a little bit. But these are just ways of eliminating too much detail. Uh, I don't know what I have here. Yeah, you can see me paint through that canvas texture, which is kind of more where I went. And then, um, so basically doing overlays like that helped me a lot to break up that perfect crisp photographic feel that was that. So if you look at, I mean, the tradition in uh, photography now with landscape, we tend to be very, very crisp. We try to do F16. We might even do hyperfocal distance. Uh, if you have a larger format camera, you might do something called shine fluke to get uh, sharpness from the front to the back, which is all fine. But the, um, if you look at painting since the 1800s, they've been doing that looseness technique. And so what I showed you with Turner and even with Bierstadt, they, the edges were just kind of actually pretty soft so that you went to the area of highest contrast and sharpness and they controlled where you looked within the image uh, that way. So if you were to do that today with your landscape work, you'd have to do it really subtly, but it could be done. I do I have an end landscape image here? Uh, no, I don't think I do. I don't have a good example of that in my work. But it, it can apply. As, you know what? I do have one other image I can show you. So I have an image that I'm entering in one of the competitions uh, on the state level and ultimately national level. Oh, Kate, Kate asked how many layers were used to render the Rembrandt girl? Do you have an idea? Uh, might have been 30. Maybe. Actually, I've never counted. Uh, here we go. So <clears throat> this image right here is an image that I'm working on. So the original image is that guy right there. And I wanted to add this guy to the front. And so you know about atmospheric perspective, et cetera. What I went in and did on this background is I wanted uh, this done photographically. So there is some of that atmospheric perspective going on with depth of field here. It's focused right about here. I don't know, let's call that a 35 millimeter lens and a 35 millimeter camera. Um, and so you can see what's going on perspective wise, leaning lines here. And you can see the softness of the edges back here. By the way, this is one of my pet peeves. Um, often when we do composites, we bring in skies. Uh, the edges of the sky to horizon line are crisp and sharp, and sometimes they're not masked very well. But I mean, it's like, that doesn't happen. Our eye doesn't see that way, nor does it happen uh, with the um, in nature anyway. So the idea of having uh, differentiation between contrast, tonality, uh, value, et cetera, between foreground and background. I see a lot of work where you're able to have it sharp and then you go in and change the contrast on the back. And unless you're doing something really, really artsy, um, to me, that looks like a mistake. Just saying. All right, so I went in and I wanted to make this uh, background here a little bit so there's my background and I positioned it properly in relationship to him. But I wanted some attention away from here and more back over here. So I did that softness technique. You see what I did? I softened a little bit, but I did it a little bit. That's the overall Gaussian blur technique. 
And then I went in and pulled some at, at the back so it looked like it fit together. And then when I finally got down to um, here, um, yeah, I ran into a problem. My problem was he was too sharp. I did this shot in the studio and he was too sharp. So that's how he originally was. And I wanted to soften him up a little bit. So I did the same technique on him where I softened the edges around him and then brought the eyes back. And the other thing is I actually had to soften the eyes because it didn't fit with the rest of the image. And then I went in and I tried to match contrast. And then I put a mask over the top of everything, a layer over the top of texture to get rid of some of that detail in there. And then I went on to do a couple other things and then ultimately it ended up looking like this. And then once I got everything done, most of the people that do composites will put another layer of texture on top just to pull, you see it right there? Just to get rid of, to hide stuff. And I don't know, like you can't see that that well. Uh, if I just do that to that, uh, it's not as obvious as I would have hoped. But yeah, um, I put a I, an overlay on this because I wanted to break up the texture, make them look a little dirtier. And so um, so I use this, uh, yeah, I guess I use this technique a lot now. And that's again because I noticed it in painting and I noticed it in, um, in Rembrandt's work originally. And so the final image of this for the presentation that I'm turning in is this guy. So I put a mat around him and did the rest, but that, um, <coughs> yeah, if I did my job right, you, I, I did that same softness around the edges and brought the attention back to the eyes because everything was sharp and it was just too much. And so I, Eliminated some information, brought everything back here, and did exactly the same thing in the background over there. So, does that translate? Mm -hmm. Okay. What else do you want to know? <laughs> what else do you have? Well, I was kind of curious about something. Yes. Have you ever done uh, any post processing with lighting the same way you do with uh, with the uh, like the Gaussian blur uh, technique? Post-processing with lighting. Um, or to like put lines, changing specular highlights, things like that? Yeah, or shadows that weren't there originally and you add them basically, that kind of a thing. Not really. Because yeah. I'm kind of a, um, when I photograph, I try to get everything I possibly can. Right. Not. Um, I, a lot of it, when I first started doing this, let's say 15, 20 years ago, again, I'm relatively well known for what I do with lighting and creating different effects. Mm -hmm. And I had a guy, let's call this 10 years ago, say, well, I can do all that in Photoshop. And the answer was, how long would it take you to do in, in Photoshop? And he said, about 24 hours. And I said, it took me about a minute. Okay, gotcha. You could do it in a lot less time using regular lighting, right? Right. And so <clears throat> my quest has been to learn how to get it originally on the negative, now on the digital file. Almost all the stuff I do um, in portraits is still digital but I'm shooting on eight by 10 inch and four by five inch because there's things I can do on film that look more organic than they do mm -hmm. digitally. And so, and I know a lot of people that'll say, well, I can do that in Photoshop, et cetera. Um, there are things, let me phrase it this way. There is normally when we think of um, imagery, we think of highlights, we think of shadows, we think we're cast shadows. And the, um, the point is, is that when we do it in the computer, we are able to do some pretty amazing things 
but they are just generally an emulation of what we're trying to do. I um, am also considered in a lot of circles a techno weenie. And so when I deal with my students, I really am kind of adamant that they understand exposure and that they don't blow out their highlights. Are you mm -hmm. nodding your head up and down, Andrew? Uh, because if you don't have anything there, sure, can you paint things in later on? Yeah, but you can paint in color uh, and they can do amazing things with holding on, especially in my room in Photoshop now, uh, Camera Raw, they do amazing things bringing texture back, but they never yeah, put it back. You start so out cool. with all the information that's already there. Right, so I shoot so that I have all the information there and then I can make choices of what I wanna pull out or what I wanna emphasize, et cetera. Uh, I find myself doing some things. Um, I mean, even in the image I showed you of the guy with the tank, uh, I would add shadows, do contrast changes and, um, but not to the, the case of trying to actually um, paint it later on. And I have some good friends that do that and they do it really well. And I, I have them try to teach it to me. Um, and then I then they come to me because I can teach them how to do it in the first place. But the other thing is, is that you have to learn how to emulate it. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the learning how to emulate it comes from art history. Uh, right. Because if you're doing it in Photoshop, you're, you're painting highlights and shadows and all those shapes and forms. And um, most of the people that I know, know a lot. And my, my problem is I know a lot about a couple things and other areas I'm just flat out stupid. And so we all specialize. And so I have my specialties and I know what I know. Uh, and then we hang, hang out with people that know other things and then we kind of talk about things. Um, so the short answer is not really, I don't do much. But then there are things that I try to do uh, that don't translate well in Photoshop. But then here's the other problem. I have a good friend called PG. Uh, he's out of Dallas. And he's like winning all the awards, kind of like Larry's winning a lot of the awards around here. And uh, but he does fashion work and all sorts of stuff. And they, they're doing things, the skin tonality, and they're doing things with black and white work and color work. Uh, actually, uh, color, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Color grading. Color grading and those things, they're doing a lot of that in post-production now. And so it has a non-realistic look, which is fine. I mean, that's the direction they're going. But a lot of the work I do doesn't, it scores well in some of the competitions, but most of the people don't get it. Mm -hmm. And I get that they don't get it because I'm out somewhere in a rabbit hole doing what I'm more interested in. Nobody really cares about most of the stuff I told you about Rembrandt. Nobody cares, nobody even knows it. Nobody ever put it together. But um, just that thing about selective focus changed my work dramatically and it works mm -hmm. a lot different. The idea about non-homogeneous light. I mean, I would have been working with umbrellas and soft boxes and I, I, I actually am better outside than I am inside with natural light. I'm really good at it. And, uh, but the, some things happen and happen naturally that it's like I've never seen before. And then I know how to find other things. But I guess that's a, the beauty of being a landscape photographer. I mean, if you're trying to do the same thing over and over again and trying to do uh, licks work or, you know, whatever, it's stuff like that, really pretty stuff, um, then that's great and that's all good. Uh, but then if you're trying to do something more interpretive and more artistic and stylistic, that may be in a totally different realm, then you've got to look at other artists and see what other artists are doing mm -hmm. and come up with your own. Yeah, right. Yeah. So most of the people um, that I get that come in and say, well, I can do that in Photoshop. I can, it's kind of like my students, they say, you know, I can find anything on Google. And then they say, okay, so look up uh, 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 Victor Avila. And Victor Avila was one of my mentors one of the greatest photographers out of San Diego, uh, and he's not on the internet. There are things, actually the things I taught you tonight, showed you tonight, don't exist in Google. Mm. They just don't exist. And so there's, there's, most of the stuff I do in lighting doesn't exist on Google. And so it's, and I mean, and there is a lot of really good information out there, but it doesn't mean, <clears throat> honestly, one of my personal quests 
is that um, there's a whole generation of photographers out there that are doing some of the best work ever done right now. But there's stuff that's been done in history that people are forgetting how to do. So remember right. I told you that uh, the Greeks and the Romans back in, uh, started at about 400 BC. They knew how to render three-dimensional faces and bodies and subjects, etc. Mm -hmm. And then beginning of the Byzantine era, about 500 AD, uh, they weren't allowed to do that anymore for political, religious reasons. And so that style was lost. And it didn't come back again until the 1300s. And then they had to rediscover it. And it took them decades and a long, long time to get to where they were a thousand years earlier. Right. And so, believe it or not, the same thing's happening. I've been around long enough that I knew some of the guys that made the transition from hard lights to soft lights and from uh, spotlights and continuous light source to umbrellas and uh, strobe and all the rest. And I'm proficient in all of them, but it's the same thing with digital. Um, we made the transition to digital, and there's a lot we've actually lost from digital that um, you can't do digitally that we can still do on film. There's not very many things, but there are things that are being lost, unfortunately. Uh, and so it's, yeah. Well, doesn't film have a better dynamic range than digital? I, I've, I've been told that. I'm not sure. That's you could true. talk to people for hours about that. People go round and round and round and round and round and round. But what film does, what digital does, digital does amazing things on the bottom end. We're doing things with noise reduction and low, higher ISOs and actually apparent sharpness than anything we could ever do with film. Yeah. On the high end, however, if you overexpose a digital file uh, by more than a stop and a half on white, on what, a true white or a kind of a partial white, uh, you'll never recover that information. Mm -hmm. you, you can do what we call digital gray, where they bring in and they just put density there, but you've lost detail and you've lost color. Right. So if you don't know how to capture that, then you don't know how to, you got to know the limitation. And so um, there are things I can do with film sunsets, backlit situations, edge light situations, uh, shooting into the sun. Digital just go nuts. Film, however, goes really creamy and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then that, the, the way digital sharpens, uh, it's brilliant. It's lousy because it sharpens everything. I, a lot of my work is out in the desert and the sandstones, et cetera. And so it'll sharp the edges of the grain, but it, the areas in between the grains of the sandstone and all the rest of it, it leaves as mush. And it doesn't know what to do with it because it doesn't have anything to put the white line next to it, next to the black line on the edge just how it sharpens. And so it will always have that digital look. Right. To make it look more like film. Yeah, there, there are some ways to make it look like film, but who cares whether it looks like film or not? It, I mean, um, but there's just some things I do for effect. It would be the difference between electric and acoustic in music. Mm -hmm. And there's some sounds that you can reproduce or uh, why would you even use uh, an orchestra? because there's some things that you can produce that you can't do with a synthesizer. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I understand that completely, yeah. Because uh, I actually have a synthesizer right behind me and- uh, Yeah, it's and, called digital sampling. Yeah, I mean, you can use digital sample over and over beyond our ability to hear it theoretically. Yeah. But uh, there is a rendering of the space in between that still exists. Yes, yeah, like brass and solo strings, they don't sound quite right. Right. And, yeah, I can't do it. You know, then you can hear it, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, they sound, can hear it. sound okay, sure. but they don't sound quite real. Right, right. But do a lot of our kids care? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although there's a whole generation now that uh, is rediscovering all that, so. Right. So that was more about Rembrandt than you ever really wanted to know. Any other questions? What's your favorite portrait lens? My favorite portrait lens? I can tell you the one I use the most. <clears throat> um, I use an 85, 18 Nikkor. I'm an icon guy. And so the... Um, 
there's like a one four version of that and there's a i shoot wide open a lot or f2 a lot um mm -hmm. because of shallow depth of field which i've always enjoyed but now that i've discovered edges and how what painters did with it, it um it works out um uh, it kind of changed my world a little bit but yeah my most popular one is an 85 but i mean when i was growing up it was a 105 and when I was coming up, it was 105, and then it was a 135 before that. And so we get shorter and shorter. I, get, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. I do a lot of head and shoulder stuff in three quarters, and it renders it really well. I like it that way. But again, I like shallow depth of field. Yeah, I got it too. So having said that, um, that would be the conversation between prime lenses and zoom lenses. You could have that conversation too, and what mm -hmm. is better. And zoom lenses are really pretty amazing. I mean, um, I have a 24 to 70 that <clears throat> is a great lens, but when I do a portrait all, even though the 70 is really close to the 85 and I shoot it at 2.8, an 85 at f2 1.8 looks completely different uh, than my 70 at uh, 2.8. Not everybody can tell, but I can. Anyone yeah. else? Let's see. Uh, Kate says, thank you. I enjoyed that a lot. Cheryl says, thanks. I think she left, had to leave. You know, if you want to get really technical, and I'll, um, I'll add one other thing as an example of style. And the more, and again, most people don't really, don't care and they don't understand and it's not that important. But Larry, since you asked me about what my favorite portrait lens is, um, I worked a lot with Hasselblad's and I also have a Leica. And then when I was shooting four by five and larger, uh, you can buy lenses from different manufacturers and put them on the same camera. And I learned early on that there's a difference between the way that the Japanese, the Fujinons and Nikons, Canons, like their lenses to look and the way the Euro Europeans, the Leicas, um etc et they want their they're more interested the europeans are more interested in what they call mtf curves and contrast and less interested in sharpness and the japanese traditionally are more interested in sharpness and they sacrifice the others and so they have a different feel yes. so if you're going to ask me what lenses i like i tend to like the european lenses although i work with japanese equipment Interesting. There's a rabbit hole for you. <laughs> so much to learn. So little time. <laughs> That's right. Just have a lot of fun. Yes. But I would highly recommend, by the way, the classes at Ella Valley, if you have a chance, uh, there's some pretty good ones over there. And the, um, I would highly recommend looking at history. You'd be amazed. Uh, most of the stuff I see uh, that's popular now is really cool. But if you look at the history of it, and again, any of us that have been around long enough know that what's cool now is on a five or 10 year cycle. And so those of you that enter competitions like a PPA or uh, even some of your affiliates, you'll find that uh, what was popular 10 years ago and would have scored incredibly highly would probably not score that well now. And your images that you're producing now will maybe not score as well then. And so you can see there's an ebb and flow in style. And so um, history, understanding what that history is and seeing where those ebb and flows have been. And a lot of the work that's being produced and considered new now actually has a history somewhere else. And it's really not new. So I had a student, actually I was in a print competition <clears throat> in Vegas international competition, WPPI, if any of you guys know that. And an image came up um, a couple of years ago as a double exposure. And uh, double exposures on digital was much more difficult than it is on film. Anyway, th this came up and there were like, I don't know how many on there on the panel. I guess there were seven of us. And like four of them were kind of young kids under 30. And they thought that was the most creative thing they'd ever seen in their life. Double exposure. <laughs> I'm going, Really? We did that in high school. 
Yeah. Uh, it's like you. This is like it, the image was not good. It was just because it was a double exposure and it was new, it was fresh, exciting. Okay. Yeah. One of my senior pictures was me inside the hole of the guitar. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> that might have been in the eighties. Yes, it mm. was. Yeah. At Sears. At Sears. Yeah. First job out of high school. Yeah. Mine was by in Africa, so there, but they yeah, still tenth and K yeah. is close. That was <laughs> so exotic condition. Yes. Yeah, going to museums and, and walking through and seeing uh old painters and even you know from like one of my favorites is uh um parish, Maxfield Parish with his light and the, his tones of his light mm -hmm. and everything. I love that. And that, you know, I liked him way before I got into photography, but then you see it in, you know, real life and you're like, oh, I have to capture that because there it is. And uh, so the more that you get into art, the more it makes your photography better. I totally agree. I also find that when you start talking to people that work in different medium, whether it's painting, whether it's drawing, whether it's sculpture, um, they have different vocabularies and they look for very different things than what we look for. And that's taught me that we have this small window that we kind of get stuck in and that uh, some of the newest and the freshest people are actually people that came from different medium that end up in photography. And they have that all, all that history and all that knowledge of uh, different ideas that we hadn't seen and what we tried to emulate. And so um, even the history of photography class is really kind of compelling because it teaches you what they tried to do and what they accomplished. And it'll give you a context for different things that we uh, do now. I mean, Ansel Adams' Dark Shadows came from the work of the modernists and uh, Josef Karsh, George Orell. His work was, he was an art student. He knew about Caravaggio. He also knew about modern art. And he knew about uh, Siskin and all the rest of them, minor white. And he understood what to do with shadows. Whereas most of the people I hang out with, uh, they have one concept of what a shadow should be. If it doesn't have detail in the shadows, then it's not any good. And it's like, yeah, it's a respectable point of view. But then there are people that have done so much more just ditching that idea and using shadows as a creative tool. So, um, that's why a lot of people don't understand my work because I, uh, I, I, you have to know who your audience is. I think I made that point once before. That uh, know who who your judges are uh, if you're entering a competition and know who you're hanging with um, because it will impact what work they respond to and what they don't. Agreed. Okay. People, okay. this is your last chance to ask questions because he has lots of information in that head. Otherwise, we're going to wrap it up. Okay. Andrew, what did you learn? <laughs> Just reinforcing, I, think, I think this is about the third time I've, I've heard the... Yeah, the, the, the third time you've seen Rembrandt? The routine, yeah. Yeah. Am I getting any better? Yeah, a lot smoother this time. <laughs> good <laughs> that's why I like Andrew okay well thank you so much Tim for being here My pleasure. Uh, a pleasure. We, so much information and stuff to think about um, is very helpful and uh, let's see what else what a fantastic presentation I appreciate you allowing me to watch Thank you. It was very interesting and I enjoyed it a lot. That was Bonnie. John said, thanks. Terry said, thank you. Very interesting. So lots of good comments. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we uh, yeah, follow him on Instagram. Check out his book. Uh, I, I, when I was, after I talked with you, I went and looked up the synopsis of it and I may end up buying it because it looks like it has lots of great stuff in there. I'm always trying to up my portrait game. So uh looks like it is a very complicated. Please go ahead. I'm trying to buy a new car. Book.
Actually, I'm not. A, I have to pay off my new Another truck. One? No, I got my. I got my truck. I love landscapes. I might be hanging, tagging along with you guys sometime. That would be great. Yeah. We're uh right now we don't have anything planned because of the whole lockdown thing. Now that yeah. things opened up, maybe we'll try and get something together. But there's stuff around people, and there's gonna be snow in the next few days. Think of Red Rock Canyon in the snow. That would look really pretty. I think that's Actually, my goal. Very, yeah. Very, very informative. I really, really enjoyed it. Learned a lot. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, have a good I'm evening. Gonna, thank you. I'm going to close it out. Thank you all for being here. Well, have, uh, a have a great week. Hey. Don't forget our. Yes. Oh, no. I was just saying thanks. Oh. You're and welcome. don't forget our next uh, meeting, February 16th, Joe Edelman, The Art of Seeing. You have to see your pictures. Bef you know, you have to see what you want to take the picture of instead of just randomly going out there and hoping you get something. Yeah, okay. for your, home your homework is to go out and look up uh, Ansel Adams and pre-visualization. There you go. Yes. Okay, okay. good night, all. All Thank right. you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you.